Hey physics students, Campbell here. In our first video on optics, we're going to talk about what is light. Well, in our last unit on magnetism, remember we talked about how Faraday discovered that changing in a magnetic field, or changing flux, results in an electric field, which generates voltage, right? Electric field is related to voltage. And then I could get current. Well, Maxwell was wondering if we could do the reverse, if we could use a source of voltage and continually change its direction, the polarity of it, could we get electric and magnetic fields? And what do you know? We can. And these are called electromagnetic waves. Now, how does this work? Well, you take a generator and we oscillate our electrons, so we create an electric field that's up and then down, and we change the strength. So here, more electrons, right? Stronger electric field. And then we decrease them as we send them back down to the bottom. And now we got an electric field down. Okay, they're away from positive towards negative, right? That's the right electric field lines. And I generate a sine wave. Notice that the sine wave travels this way, which makes it a transverse wave, right? Transverse waves, the medium is oscillating, well, the medium, in this case, my electric fields or magnetic fields are oscillating up and down but it's traveling that way. So here I have an electric field on the y-axis. My magnetic field is always perpendicular to it and always in the same phase. So that means as the electric field increases, the magnetic field increases, and as it decreases, it decreases together. So the electric and magnetic field are always in sync with each other. They're always in phase with each other. They have matching crests and matching troughs. And they're always perpendicular but they move outward. So in this example, um, my electric field's on the y-axis, my magnetic field's on the z-axis, and it's traveling in the x-axis. Now, because these are oscillating electric and magnetic fields, I don't need a medium. Wait, light doesn't need a medium either, does it? Hmm. Whereas, like, sound, sound needs a medium because it's got to vibrate particles. But these are just oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So they don't need anything to travel. They can travel in a vacuum. Once we create them, they just keep going. Another thing Maxwell discovered is that they travel at the speed of light. Speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Write that down because you're going to need it. And that's in a vacuum. Wait, light travels at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Holy cow, light is an electromagnetic wave. Now, totally mind blown, right? So light is the oscillation of electric and magnetic fields. But, wait, so that's a wave? Now, back in the day, Huygens and Young had lots of proof that light was a wave because it shows polarization, interference, diffraction, all those are light or wave properties. But Newton was like, no man, it's a corpuscle. It travels like a ray, a corpuscle is like a particle. It travels like a ray. And if you look at shadows, that seems pretty clear. You look at image formation by lenses and mirrors, that's a ray. And then of course, later came along Einstein, and Einstein's like, no, man, it's a particle. Kind of like a corpuscle. And demonstrated that with the photoelectric effect, which, of course, we're going to talk about in our next unit when we talk about modern physics. In this unit, we're going to focus on the wave and the ray properties of light. Now, one equation you're going to need, so write this down somewhere, that the frequency is related to wavelength through speed. So the speed, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th, is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. I call this the velocity is the lambda equation. But it means that at high frequencies, we have short wavelengths, right? They're inversely related to each other. And you can see that if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum. If we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, here we have long wavelengths. Radio waves have long wavelengths, which means they have low frequency. High wavelength, low frequency. Um, here's our visible light, so we go radio waves, microwaves, infrared, and then we get to the visible spectrum, which is between 400 and 750 nanometers. And then we get to the high frequency, short wavelength waves that, light waves that do damage, like x-rays, ultraviolet rays, right, sunburn, blah, and of course gamma rays. Notice the naming. Waves down here, 
when they're longer wavelength and rays up here where they're shorter wavelength. Hmm, kind of interesting. We're going to talk more about the electromagnetic spectrum when we talk about modern physics. But for now, write down that the visible light spectrum is between about 400 nanometers and 750 nanometers. Now, remember when we talked about sound last year, when sound moves into a denser medium, it speeds up because it can move particles faster. But light waves actually slow down. So anytime light travels through like water or glass or even air, because it's not a vacuum, it will slow down. And that's because this electric field starts to interact with the atoms in the material, right? And it starts to oscillate their electrons and it slows them down. You can also kind of think about like if you're running on the beach and you run into the water, right? Now boom, you slow down. It's kind of the same sort of thing. And there's a name for this. There's a way to calculate. It's called the index of refraction. And the symbol for it is an N. And this index of refraction is the speed of light in a vacuum, it's a ratio, to the speed of light in the medium. So mathematically, N, refractive index, is the speed of light in a vacuum, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by the speed in the medium. Now, everything moves slower. All light, I should say. All light moves, moves slower in a denser medium than a vacuum, which is like everything, right? So that means the velocity is always going to be less than the speed of light in a vacuum. And that means that refractive indices values are always greater than 1. So in a vacuum, it's 1. Air is so close to 1 that in this unit, we're just going to use 1 for air. And you need to know that the refractive index of air is 1. Um, the other refractive indices you don't have to memorize because I'll give them to you. But you can see water, 1.33. Glass is around 1.5. So as we move into denser mediums, the refractive index will increase because it slows down. Now, one thing you should know is that the frequency of a wave does not change as it moves from one medium to another. And that's a trick question, and I'm going to ask you that. I'm going to ask you, what is the frequency of light when it moves into the glass? but it's the same, so don't get fooled. But if it slows down and the frequency doesn't change, well, that means the wavelength has to change. And in fact, because the light slows down, right, and velocity is frequency times wavelength, if it slows down, then the wavelength must go down. It must get shorter. We, have, we can calculate that by using our velocities to lambda equation and our n is c over v equation and smook them all together. And we get the wavelength in the material is equal to the wavelength in a vacuum of that light divided by the refractive index. So write this equation down. You're going to be using it a bunch. So the wavelength in the film or the other medium is equal to the wavelength in the vacuum divided by the refractive index in the material. Remember. Frequency doesn't change. So that means that the wavelength is always going to be shorter than when it's in a vacuum. And that should make sense because refractive indices are always greater than one. One property of waves um, is polarization. And polarization is actually very important in light. Um, we usually talk about the plane of polarization being the electric field plane. So in this case, the electric field's on my y-axis. So I would say that this wave is vertically polarized because the electric field is oscillating here on the y-axis. I don't know why we picked the electric field. I guess I probably could look that up. Now, if you think about light in general, right, light comes from these oscillating electrons in like the sun, right, in the atoms of the sun. Um, and so you can't line them all up. It's not like a magnet where you can line the oscillations up the same. So that means that light, all light really, has random direction. So we call that unpolarized because we have, you know, maybe we have some coming vertically polarized, but maybe some's at an angle and maybe some's this way. So we get light in all orientations on all different planes. But we can polarize it. And by polarizing, what that means is we confine it to one plane. So here comes my light in all sorts of directions, and I put it through a polarizing filter, and it will only allow light in one plane to transmit through it. And usually polarizing filters are like plastic sheets, 
um, that have some sort of polymer in it. And the polymer orientation absorbs the oscillation of those electric fields um, in one direction and only allows, or in all directions, but only allows one direction out. Um, so only the component of the light that's um, perpendicular to the polarizing filter comes out of the filter. Now, a couple years ago, I was driving uh, home from a seminar and I noticed I was had to use my GPS because I had no idea where I was going. And I noticed that as I rotated my head, sometimes I couldn't see the map very well. What? So sunglasses, right, have, at well, least the good ones, have polarizing filters in them to block out all the light rays that are coming in all sorts of different directions at your eyeballs. And so some screens on navigation systems are also plain polarized. It helps to reduce some of the um, blurring and scatter of the light. So as I turned my head, I would lose the map. So don't turn your head. Pretty cool, huh? So polarizing filters are these little polymers. Um, and I can change the intensity of light using these polymers. So here I have them and they're uh, in the same plane. So this, like this one picture uh, right here. Um, but as I rotate it, one is called actually the um, polarizer and the other one's actually called the analyzer. And as I rotate it, it starts to block out the light. And we'll do this in class because it's probably hard to see in the video. That's why I put a picture in here. But once I get my filters at a 90 degree angle to each other, then no light comes through at all. It's pretty cool. Polarizers are cool. All right, now in your WSQ, you've got a couple questions to answer. The first one is this. I, move my, oh, I can't move my picture out of the way. Um, the first question is, a light wave travels um, as a plane wave from air with a refractive index of 1 into glass with a refractive index of 1.5. Which diagram shows the correct waves inside the glass? A, B, or C. Mark it on your WSQ. We'll see if you get it right. Next question. I have orange light, which has a wavelength of about 600 nanometers, and it hits a piece of glass, which has a refractive index of 1.5. What is the speed of the light? in the glass. Hmm. See if you can figure that out. Put it in your WSQ form for question number two and we'll check it in class. All right. See you in class.